Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's on Your Ballot, Seven Constitutional Amendments. My name is Andrea Himoff, and I'm the Executive Director of Action Utah. Action Utah is a nonpartisan community advocacy organization empowering Utahns from both sides of the aisle to get civically engaged in order to impact the issues you care about most. Now, during the 2020 elections, we've been providing informational resources to voters in order to help get out the vote and ensure that Utahns can cast an informed ballot up and down the ballot uh, in the 2020 election. Today is the third in our What's on Your Ballot series. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Today, we're talking about the seven constitutional amendments that will appear on statewide ballots. Now, according to Utah state law, the Constitution cannot be changed unless both the legislature and the voters decide to do so. So all seven measures on the Utah ballot this year appear there because they have already passed in 2019 or 2020 via a bill that received two thirds majority vote by the Utah state legislature. And now it's up to Utah voters to provide a simple majority vote in order to pass those into law or not. Here's a list of the seven uh, constitutional amendment questions that will appear on the ballot. I'm gonna share my screen, screen so you can see them. Now, these are the seven questions and as you can see, they do not have descriptive names. They are called constitutional amendment A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now, we've added our own descriptions later in this presentation, but ours are unofficial names. Don't worry, for each question, we'll show you the official certified ballot language. So let's go ahead and start with Constitutional Amendment A. Here's the official language for the amendment. Shall the Utah Constitution be amended to change words that apply to a single gender, such as the word men, to words that are not limited to a single gender, such as the word persons. And then the ballot will ask you if you are for or against this measure. This amendment is considered to be a simple terminology update. We call it the gender neutral constitutional language amendment internally because that is a descriptor of what this amendment does. There are 237 sections in the Utah Constitution, and this amendment pertains to only six of those sections that are out of alignment with the rest of the Constitution. And the goal here is to create some uniformity and common flow and cleanup. So the rest of the Constitution is already written in a gender neutral way, and there are six sections that have some discrepancies. So for example, there's a section in Article 1, Section 2, referring to open courts and injury done to a person that refers to him and his a few times. And they'll be replacing those words if this amendment passes with words like person or the accused. Uh, legislators did vote unanimously in the House and the Senate to pass the bill SJR 7, sponsored by Senator Deidre Henderson. And this bill passed unanimously in both the House and the Senate, except for those absent or not voting. So that's Constitutional Amendment A. Constitutional Amendment B uh, states that, shall the Utah Constitution be amended to specify that certain requirements that a person must meet to be eligible for the office of Senator or Representative in the Utah Legislature apply at the time the person is elected or appointed? We call this one Legislator Qualifications Amendment. Now, this bill uh, is pertaining to the fact that current law does not specify and therefore is unclear about the specific timeline when a legislator needs to meet the qualifications. And so rather than changing that deadline, it's really only just specifying when that person must uh, meet a qualification such as age. Legislators did vote unanimously to pass the bill HJR4 by Representative Craig Hall, which put, put this question on the Utah ballot. Next is Constitutional Amendment C. Shall the Utah Constitution be amended to make the following changes to the Utah Constitution's ban on slavery and involuntary servitude? 
remove the language that allows slavery and involuntary serv servitude as punishment for a crime, and clarify that the ban does not affect the otherwise lawful administration of the criminal justice system. Now, let me show you exactly what that looks like. This is Article 1, Section 21 of the Utah Constitution. Constitutional Amendment C would remove the language that is struck out in this slide. And so slavery and involuntary servitude are uh, po prohibited by the state constitution currently, except as a punishment for a crime. And this amendment would remove that exception. So uh, the repeal of this language, it's worth noting, uh, does not affect the otherwise lawful administration of the criminal justice system. And to clarify, incarceration, work requirements, and community service requirements are not the same thing as slavery, which concerns the definition of a person who is considered the property of another person. Now, this amendment too, was placed on the ballot via a unanimous vote in the Utah legislature on the bipartisan 2019 bill HJR 8 by Representative Sandra Hollins and Senator Jake Anderegg. Now many political and religious leaders spoke up in favor of this bill during committee hearings. Nobody spoke against it. This same change was made in the Colorado Constitution last year, and there are currently other states working to remove language of slavery from their constitutions as well. Um, and there's an effort going on simultaneously to remove this language from the United States Constitution, where it appears in, amendment, in the 13th Amendment. This is a really complicated issue, and to learn more about this issue, we invite you to watch a video from our previous event, What's on Your Ballot? Removing Slavery from the Utah Constitution, which you can find on our events page at actionutah.org or on social media platforms at Action Utah. Let's move on to Constitutional Amendment D. Shall the Utah Constitution be amended to rewrite a provision relating to water, excuse, excuse me, to municipal water rights and sources of water supply, allow a municipality to define the boundary of the municipality's water service area, and to set the terms of water service for that area. State that a municipality is not prevented from supplying water to users to water users outside the municipality's boundary or entering into a contract to supply water outside the municipality's water service area if the water is more than what is needed for the municipality's water service area and modify the basis upon which a municipality is allowed to exchange water rights or sources of water supply. This may sound a little bit complicated, uh, really, this issue boils down to the fact that municipalities can currently supply water to users and developers outside their boundaries only through contracts that can be canceled with just 30 days notice and for no reason. And advocates for this measure suggest that that puts consumers access to water as well as property values potentially at risk. It also prevents those con consumers from having any say in the pricing of the water they receive through such contracts. Now, legislators have been working on this issue since 2018, along with the Executive Water Task Force, and came out with two companion bills to address it. Uh, first was uh, the 2019's bill HB 31 by Representative Kim Coleman, uh, which requires cities to create a designated water service area to provide water outside its municipal boundaries and to give notice to those residents living outside the municipal boundaries but within the water service area that their water supply cannot be terminated. Now this bill doesn't really have any teeth unless constitutional amendment D is passed. And so a second bill uh, HJR 3 by Representative Kevin Stratton was passed this year uh, to place this ballot question on the ballot uh, in order to allow municipalities to sell water within a water service area. Now water service areas would be determined by ordinance 
which requires public notice and opportunity for comment. At this point, it's up to voters to decide if municipalities should be able to determine those water service areas. And the whole package, as I said, only works if Constitutional Amendment D passes. Legislators did vote unanimously in 2020 to pass HJR 3 and put this question on the ballot. Constitutional Amendment E says, shall the Utah Constitution be amended to preserve the individual right to hunt and fish, including the right to use traditional hunting and fishing methods subject to certain regulation, and establish public hunting and fishing as the preferred way of managing and controlling wildlife. Participation in hunting and fishing is on a downward trend across the country, uh, but is on an upward trend in Utah, according to the sponsor of the bill that put this question on the ballot, Representative Casey Snyder. Representative Snyder was concerned about maintaining the opportunity to hunt and fish into the future. The measure establishes a constitutional right to hunt and fish within the following restrictions. Hunting and fishing is limited to traditional methods, which are subject to state statute. There is still no right to trespass and the right to public property is explicitly protected in Representative Snyder's bill. The state remains sovereign over natural resources and the division of wildlife resources can still regulate hunting and fishing. This bill further protects hunting and fishing as a conservation mechanism through the license fees that it generates and as a mechanism for wildlife management. This amendment does not address threats to wildlife and hunting and fishing from growth, development, pollution, or other outside threats. Now, 22 states have passed measures such as this, including Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. Legislators did pass HJR 15, Representative Snyder's bill, in 2020 with a vote of 61 to nine, uh, 61 in favor, nine opposed, five absent in the House, and 18 in favor, nine opposed, and two absent in the Senate, which put this question on the ballot. Speaking in favor during public hearings were several hunting and fishing organizations, and only one person spoke in opposition, viewing the measure as trivial, where there has been no threat to hunting or fishing. Let's move along to Constitutional Amendment F. Shall the Utah Constitution be amended to change when annual general sessions of the Utah legislature begin from the 4th of Monday in January to a day in January designated by a law passed by the Utah legislature and exclude state holidays that are not also federal holidays from counting towards the maximum number of days of the Utah legislature's annual general sessions. Currently, the Utah Constitution mandates that the state legislature must meet beginning on the fourth Monday in January. If the legislature wanted to change the start date, they would need to amend the Constitution each time by passing a constitutional amendment with a two thirds majority vote in the legislature and voter approval. Constitutional Amendment F would provide that the legislature may set the January session start date in statute rather than requiring a constitutional amendment each time to change the start date. The amendment does not change the length of the 45 day limit of the legislative session, nor does it change the exclusion of federal holidays from counting toward that 45 day limit. If Amendment F passes, it will take effect on January 1st of 2021. Now, a companion bill called SB 156, also by Representative, excuse me, Senator Ann Milner, would change the start date immediately in January of 2021 to start one week earlier with a Tuesday start date. That's right after Martin Luther King Day. The law specifically stipulates that the start date will be on the third Tuesday of the month of January. The bill that placed this constitutional amendment measure on the ballot is called SJR 3, also by Senator Milner. And that bill passed unanimously in the Senate 
but with a 50 to 24 vote in the House with one abstaining or absent. Legislature, excuse me, legislators did speak out on both sides of the argument in the floor sessions. Those in favor believe there's a convenience in moving the date up closer uh, in order for legislators to dive in and end the legislative session sooner. But legislators who were opposed want to keep the date where it is in order to give legislators and their families more space between the holidays and the start of the session and more time to prepare before the session begins. The start date, it is worth noting, has been changed in the Utah Constitution two times in the past 20 years. Now, last but not least is Constitutional Amendment G. This is the biggest change being proposed on the 2020 ballot. The Constitutional Amendment G reads, shall the Utah Constitution be amended to expand the uses of money the state receives from income taxes and intangible property taxes to include supporting children and supporting people with a disability? Now, let me give you some background on this issue. Utah's constitution currently includes a earmark for education funding by limiting the use of income tax revenues for public education and higher education spending only. Yet our state faces an imbalance of revenues to pay for essential and other services traditionally paid for through sales tax revenues. After the collapse of tax reform efforts late last year, the Utah legislature came up with an alternative solution to address the growing budget imbalance question while creating protections for education funding. Constitutional Amendment G modifies the constitutionally mandated earmark on state income tax revenues from covering only education to also funding services for children and people with disabilities. In other words, a pot of money that is currently reserved only for education spending would now be shared also with some social services spending. At its core, this amendment is about balancing the state budget. The Utah Constitution mandates that all revenues from income tax be used for education funding only. In 1996, the Constitution was changed to add higher education into the income tax revenue pot in addition to K through 12 education, so that the constitutionally mandated, excuse me, earmarked funds would need to cover costs that had been paid for previously from the general fund. So higher education had been paid for from the general fund. Uh, and in 1996, it was placed together so that education funding was to cover both K through 12 and um, higher education. The general fund is funded by sales tax and other revenue, which cover, covers other essential services in the state. The problem is that sales tax revenue has been declining steadily over the years and threatens to no longer cover the other items in the state budget. The legislature attempted to solve this problem with a major tax reform effort, which failed late last year. So the budget problems remain. Now the conflict around this issue is that legislature, legislators perceive that there's more income tax revenue than is needed for education and not enough sales tax revenue to cover other costs like transportation, healthcare, and social services. Some education experts and community members perceive that education in Utah is already deeply underfunded. And there's concern about siphoning off revenues that are currently earmarked solely for education and putting them towards social services, another area that has been traditionally underfunded in Utah. Constitutional Amendment G was placed on the ballot via a bill SJR 9 by Senator Dan McKay, which underwent long negotiations and several iterations before passing by a vote of 23 in favor, six opposed, zero abstaining in the Senate, and 67 in favor, five opposed, and three abstaining or absent in the House. Although it is now supported by most major education groups in Utah, it's worth noting that support has not been unanimous or straightforward within all of those groups. Constitutional Amendment G itself is very fairly simple in the language, but it comes along with little detail about what exactly would be covered for children and people with disabilities or how much of the revenue would be used for those purposes. 
though it is estimated that roughly $600 million per year would be used for programs pertaining to children and people with disabilities. As with many other measures, a companion bill was passed alongside SJR 9 called HB, excuse me, HB 357 by Representative Robert Spendlove. That bill attempts to shore up education funding by ensuring there will be ongoing funding in the base budget for the minimum school program, including for student population growth and inflation factor, and also creating a rainy day fund called the Public Education Stabilization Fund for education in the amount up to $400 million. Proponents of this measure believe Constitutional Amendment G and HB 357 will jointly resolve the budget imbalance problem while shoring up and guaranteeing education funding, something that the constitutional earmark alone does not do. Opponents believe that Constitutional Amendment G is a bad idea because it takes money away from education to give to social services, both being traditionally underfunded needs in Utah. Opponents like the Utah Citizens Council point to data that has shown that Utah has a teacher retention problem that stems mostly from low salaries and needed salary increases alone cost 600 to 700 million dollars per year, the same amount roughly that would be extracted from the income tax revenues and siphoned off for other social services. Some proponents believe that a better solution is, excuse me, opponents, some opponents believe that a better solution is increasing sales taxes for social services and keeping the constitutional earmark for education in place as is, reserved solely for education funding. So this is obviously a complicated issue. And to learn more, we invite you to watch a video from our previous event, What's on Your Ballot? education funding, which you can find on our events page at actionutah.org and on our social media platforms with the tag at Action Utah. We hope this event has helped you to become a more informed voter and that you will not only cast a vote in the 2020 elections, but you'll encourage others to cast a vote as well. Thanks so much for joining us.